Just who is our speaker, Eddie Tabash? Uh, he graduated <coughs> magna cum laude uh, from the UCLA in 1973. He has a law degree from Loyola uh, University in 76. Uh, he's a member of the California State Bar, American Bar Association, LA County Bar Association, and the Beverly Hills Bar Association. And we went to dinner last night, and I found out that he doesn't like bars. He do, he's a teetotaler. So I don't know what he's doing with all these bars. <laughs> um, he's the chair of the National Legal uh, Committee for the Americans uh, United for the Separation of Church and State, which has been one of his main uh, issues for his entire career, I think. Filed many briefs before uh, various courts, including the Supreme Court, for causes that we support, of course, and that the main one that we're harping on right now is the separation of church and state, and you'll find out that uh, we may be swimming upstream here. Uh, he promotes atheism and secular humanism. He's a political activist. He's uh, supported some of the past presidents and others, uh, like Hart and uh, Clinton, and uh, Carter. Um, he's a supporter of abortion rights and uh, contraceptive availability for everyone that need it. Uh, gay and lesbian uh, marriages. Let's uh, give it up for Eddie Tabash. Good morning, everybody. I haven't been here in seven years. It's good to see my old friends here in Tucson. I want to thank Jerry and the Arizona Free Thinkers for bringing me in from the great distance of Los Angeles. There might be, between our two states, a greater ideological difference than there is a geographical one. <laughs> our purpose this morning will be narrowly defined. We are going to be speaking about the threat that President Trump's impending nominees to the Supreme Court, the threats that those nominees will bring to the utter destruction of the separation of church and state. But before I get into the contemporary threat, I want to take you with your handout through the remarkable history where we can demonstrate that the framers of the First Amendment actually intended for believers to be equal before uh, the law with non-believers, and the framers explicitly intended for the protection of the rights of conscience of everyone, which means that it was their goal to make sure that government could not favor religious believers over atheists or over minority religions. When the 55 authors of the original Constitution gathered in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia to craft the original Constitution, they were requested to pray when they hit roadblocks in their deliberations. They refused to do so. There's only one reference to religion in the original Constitution. Article 6, Clause 3 prohibits any religious test for political office. So that was a negative reference to religion for the first time in world history in a nation's founding document. A future Supreme Court Justice, James Iredell, in debating this prohibition said that we must allow pagans and those who have no religion at all to be elected to office. Now, the two principal architects of the separation of church we state and state as embedded in the establishment and free exercise clauses of the Constitution were James Madison, the future third president of the United, uh, fourth president of the United States, and Thomas Jefferson, the then future third president of the United States. All scholars agree that their views on church-state separation were identical. And so we can easily 
with great security and historical accuracy attribute the views of one uh, to the other. Thomas Jefferson was the major influence on James Madison in terms of church-state separation. But even before that, even before that, Madison, four years before drafting what was to become the First Amendment, opposed a general assessment for the benefit of all religion in his native Virginia. And so to say that the principal architect of the First Amendment intended the religion clauses to favor religion or to favor Christianity is refuted by our historical record. This is what James Madison wrote four years before drafting the initial form of the First Amendment. During almost 15 centuries has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial. What has been its fruits, more or less in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy, ignorance and servility in the laity in both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. This is not somebody who wanted government to be influenced by religious doctrine. And then in 1786, when Jefferson was in Paris, Madison secured the passage through the Virginia legislature of his and Jefferson's Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which shielded minority viewpoints on religion against the tyranny of the majority, protecting both non-believers and religious dissenters. And proof of this was many years later, in 1821, when Jefferson wrote his autobiography. He talked about how happy he was that the effort to protect only Christians was defeated and Jefferson wrote he was delighted that the bill that he and Madison got through the legislature protected the infidel of every denomination. If Jefferson and Madison were interested in protecting infidels, they certainly did not craft, and they did not through Madison's pen craft a constitution that was going to allow government to favor belief over non-belief. Jefferson was a deist and did not believe in a divinity of Jesus. In a letter to William Short in 1819, Jefferson stated that among the claims about Jesus that he rejected were making him a God, immaculate conception, miraculous powers, resurrection, visible ascension, the Trinity, original sin, and atonement. Toward the end of his life, Jefferson, the retired third president of the United States, writing to John Adams, the retired second president of the United States, said, and the day will come when the mystical generation by Jesus, by the supreme being as his father in the womb of a virgin, will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. <laughs> and then in 1825, Jefferson wrote in a letter that the book of Revelation is merely the ravings of a lunatic, not more worthy or capable of explanation than the incoherence of our own nightly dreams. But here, two years, before helping to guide Madison in the crafting of the First Amendment. In his notes on Virginia, Jefferson, speaking for himself and obviously for James Madison, expressed beautifully the concept of church-state separation, which is protecting the equal rights of conscience for everyone. And now I want to give you the thread that runs through all the historical record of the development of the religion clauses of the Constitution. Prior to any other consideration, before any other factor is taken into account, they wanted to protect the rights of conscience of everyone, meaning that they wanted to make sure that each individual's composition of their own views on matters of religion 
regardless of what those views might be, will be left to the individual without any coercion from governmental authority. And if that is the thread, there's no way that they would want government to favor one set of beliefs over others. And Jefferson wrote, the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. But it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are 20 gods or no God. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. No one to ever sit in the White House other than Jefferson has ever said anything like that. He was very, very far advanced. And also, if we speak about the views that he and Madison held with respect to clergy in government. In a letter, 1813, to Alexander von Humboldt, Jefferson wrote, history furnishes no example of a priest-ridden people maintaining a free civil government. It marks the lowest grade of ignorance. And then he further wrote that in every country and every age, the priest, meaning all clergy, has been hostile to liberty. Now, Madison, writing in The Federalist in 1788 to urge the new states to ratify the Constitution, said that there shouldn't be any religious test for office and that office should be open to merit of every description without regard to any particular profession of faith. Then in October of 1788, Madison wrote to Jefferson saying he was afraid the majority of people would deny infidels the right to hold office and narrow the rights of conscience. This is remarkably the most concrete, solid proof we could have that James Madison specifically intended the First Amendment of which he was the principal architect to equally protect us non-believers. And it is a remarkable historical record considering how otherwise sparse the record is. When Madison introduced the first form of the First Amendment. It would have prevented government from abridging the civil rights of anyone because of religious belief or worship. He brought to bear everything that we now know he was thinking about protecting the equal rights of everyone. Remember this thread I just gave you, the unbroken thread of the rights of conscience. Well, Representative Daniel Carroll, during the House debate on what was to become the First Amendment, said the rights of conscience are in their nature of such peculiar delicacy, they won't even be able to bear the gentlest touch of government hand. Once again, leave the individual alone. Now, today's religious right-wingers on the courts take the view that government cannot favor one religion over others, but among primarily monotheistic religions, and this is important, government can favor religion collectively against us non-believers. I have proof that this is not what the framers intended. Because if that were true, two proposed wordings that were rejected by the Senate on September 3rd of 1789 and were never brought back, one of them would have been adopted. One of them said, no law establishing any religious sect or society in preference to any other, the other no law establishing any particular denomination or religion in preference to any other. If all the framers meant to do was to say government couldn't favor one religion over another, but could side with religion collectively against non-belief, one of these two wordings would have been adopted and they were both rejected. 
in the House Conference, House and Senate Conference Committee, the final wording of the Establishment Clause, shepherded through by Madison, was no law respecting an establishment of religion, no law that can even show respect to any establishment of religion. This was what much more sweeping than any of these former proposed wordings, which shows that there was a progressive process of making sure that the non-believer is equal and the rights of conscience of everyone will be fully protected. And we can also look to the writings of both of them later on to see what they meant. And we see Jefferson in 1802 with his intimate involvement in helping Madison that the First Amendment erected a wall of separation between church and state. Jefferson as president even refused to issue Thanksgiving proclamations because he felt they were religious exercises. Madison even wanted to limit the power of religious entities to accumulate and to hold property. He opposed tax exemptions for property already owned by religious institutions. And then in 1868, we passed the 14th Amendment, which was then later properly interpreted to extend the Bill of Rights to all of the states. One of the reasons why I gave you the handout and we went through this history is to arm all of you with the truth and the facts to defend the separation of church and state and to unfortunately join in the decades long struggle we will have to undertake if we lose it in order to get it back. The political events of the past year have shaken the foundation of modern secular government to the very core. If the president is able to appoint just one more, let alone more, just one more justice to the United States Supreme Court, everything I just told you will be nullified and we will have for the first time ever a Supreme Court sanctioned religious tyranny. All branches of government will be free to favor belief over non-belief. And of course, women will lose their right to access to safe and legal abortion. The Supreme Court has already decided in a five to four decision that businesses that deal with the general public and are not themselves religious in purpose but are owned by religious people can have special exemption from the law that requires employers to provide insurance coverage for contraception. Notice how dangerous this is. If only the religious can avoid complying with otherwise universally applicable law, then we have a legal system that allows exemptions for only the religious and no one else, and that in itself violates every concept of government neutrality and separation of church and state because only the religious are given legal exemptions. Now, for our purposes, the separation of church and state, and I'm quoting from Everson versus Board of Education, 1947. This is what we are trying to hold on to. Neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church Neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. N neither can force nor influence a person to go to or remain away from church against their will or force them to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. No person can be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs for church attendance or non-attendance. No tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions, whatever they may be called, or whatever form they may adopt to teach or practice religion. Then a reaffirmation in 1961 
in Torcaso versus Watkins, neither a state nor the federal government can constitutionally force a person to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. No branch of government can constitutionally pass laws or impose requirements which aid all religions as against non-believers. Neither can government aid those religions based on belief in the existence of God as against those religions founded on different beliefs. So you can see that up until this point, we have had a Supreme Court that recognized the true intent of the framers. But a shift of just one vote on the court, and all of this is destroyed. Justice Scalia has been replaced by Justice Neil Gorsuch, who is as extreme as his predecessor in wanting to repeal the separation of church and state. I've set this up for all of you by giving you this remarkable history to now introduce the chilling dissent of Justice Scalia in 2005 with the admonition that a change of one vote on the Supreme Court and everything I just told you will be nullified and the chilling totalitarian religiously oppressive language I'm about to quote directly from Scalia's dissent will become the law of the land. Scalia dissented when the court forced the schools in Kentucky to take the Ten Commandments off the walls of elementary schools. The principle that government cannot favor religion over irreligion is demonstrably false. He doesn't read history like we just did. This is already a clear example, but look at this. There are now four justices on the Supreme Court that agree with what I'm about to read to you. We cannot afford the fifth and final majority making justice. It is entirely clear from our national history and historical practices that the Establishment Clause permits the disregard of polytheists, believers in unconcerned deities, just as it permits the disregard of devout atheists. What does it mean to say the Constitution permits our disregard? How far will that go? Will Restaurant owners be able to say, my religion says I can't deal with atheists, I won't sit you at the lunch counter. Remember something like that as part of our history? Another group of people. Will banks be able to say, sorry, we don't lend to people who don't believe in God? Where does it end? What does it mean to say that the Constitution permits the disregard of not just us, but people who believe in many gods or have a deistic view. It's even worse because one of the justices on the court, Clarence Thomas, has a completely distorted view of the Establishment Clause. He says, everything I just told you is wrong, and that the Establishment Clause only exists to get this one prevent the federal government from stopping each state from having their own official religion. According to Clarence Thomas, this means each state can have its own official church and that the federal government cannot interfere. Imagine the civil strife that that would cause. Uh, Neil Gorsuch is worse than Scalia in many respects. And most notably, Scalia, when I met him in 1998, told me that he doesn't believe there's a constitutional right to death with dignity, to abortion, but if the states confer the right, he'll accept it and let the states give those rights. At least with death with dignity, Gorsuch takes the opposite view. He wrote a book 12 years ago in which he argued that even if the states want to allow the terminally ill or those in intractable pain to end their lives with physician assistance, the state can't 
because the state cannot participate in the taking of innocent life. So Gorsuch goes a step further. Uh, Justice Kennedy, though we lose him on a number of cases, is with us on the core issue of church-state separation, which is the equality of believers and non-believers. He turns 82 in July and is rumored to be retiring at the end of this term. Given the composition of the Senate today, if Kennedy retires in June, the president will replace him with a religious right winger, giving the court the fifth vote for the first time ever for religious tyranny. Also, if the Senate does not change political leadership in the November elections this year, there will be no stopping any extreme judge or justice from being confirmed. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a staunch church-state separation, turns 85 next month. If Trump replaces her and Kennedy, there is now a six to three majority in favor of abolishing the separation of church and state. Now, over and above the Supreme Court, Trump has given us an attorney general who in his confirmation hearings before the Senate, when asked if he thinks secular people can know the truth as well as religious people, said that he wasn't sure. And this is why Jeff Sessions also said that President Obama's appointee to the court, Sonia Sotomayor, cannot be trusted to make good decisions because of her lack of belief in a higher power. Quoting the Attorney General of the United States, if you have secularization in the world and don't believe in a higher being, maybe you don't believe there is any truth. Um, Betsy DeVos, the Secretary of Education, once compared her work in education reform to a biblical battleground where she wants to advance God's kingdom. We narrowly avoided the election of a pure theocrat to the United States Senate from Alabama, supported by the president and the attorney general, when Roy Moore was the chief justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, and we narrowly beat him, he actually spoke about the death penalty for gay people. He wrote, the state carries the power of the sword that is the power to prohibit conduct with physical penalties, such as confinement and even execution. It must use that power to prevent the subversion of children toward this lifestyle. Uh, William Donahue of the Catholic League for Civil Rights doesn't want equal access to public property uh, for non-religious in terms of displays. Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, who is now a leading religious right-wing extremist, has said in speaking of the president, never in my lifetime have we had a president willing to take such a strong outspoken stand for the Christian faith. And he says, I think God is working on President Trump's heart and in his mind. <laughs> and I think finally, this is Reverend Franklin Graham, will get the right judges. That's what it comes down to. Now, to show you what's happening around the country with the religious right, Florida has a new law making it easier for creationists and climate change deniers to harass their local school district boards if they don't approve of what's being said in the classroom. The Associated Press uh, has reported that there have been a number of complaints by religious fundamentalist parents over the teaching of evolution in that state. Also, there is an effort in Florida to repeal the state constitutional provision that bars public money from aiding 
religious institutions. Uh, Mississippi is trying to pass a law that would require teachers to post the Ten Commandments in public classrooms. Uh, also, a trial court judge in Texas interfered in a jury's deliberations in a criminal case because he said God told him that he needed to tell the jury how to decide the case. Now we're going to talk about some of the other judges that Trump has successfully placed on the federal trial courts and federal courts of appeal. All of these people are the pool from which he will choose the next Supreme Court justice. In October of last year, Amy Barrett confirmed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeal, based in Chicago, said that if there is a conflict between the law and a judge's religion, the judge should rule based on their religion. In a 2015 letter to a group of Catholic bishops, Barrett said, along with others, we give witness that the church's teachings on the meaning of human sexuality, the significance of sexual differences, and the complementarity of men and women is correct. Jeff Mateer, whose nomination Trump had to withdraw from confirmation, said that transgender children were part of Satan's plan. And not even his sponsor, Senators Ted Cruz and John Cornyn of Texas, withdrew their support. Mateer also said that we needed to have conversion therapy and if we have same-sex marriage, it'll lead to polygamy and bestiality. Trump also nominated and had to withdraw to a Texas federal court judgeship, Brett Talley. Before being nominated for the judgeship, uh, Talley investigated paranormal activity. Somebody that we would need to sick our skeptical investigators on. Uh, he also has nominated for a federal judgeship and is likely to get confirmed uh, Matthew Kosmarek, who in an op-ed in the National Catholic Register came out against legally available contraception, no-fault divorce, and even criticized Ronald Reagan when he was governor of California for signing into law the Therapeutic Abortion Act in 1969. And he endorsed the Catholic Church's statement that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. Trump has nominated for the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal governing Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, Kyle Duncan. Duncan represented a block of 15 states opposed to marriage equality. He has also successfully confirmed Stephen Grass to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeal, and Grass was on the board of the Nebraska Family Alliance and supported conversion therapy. Also in the town of London, Kentucky, a state prison forced men, male prisoners, to attend a prayer rally. This is a level of coercion, the likes of which we have never seen in the United States. The president has also reinstated the Mexico City policy, which eliminates American funding for international organizations that provide abortion services. The other thing that we have to deal with are these so-called religious freedom laws that, as I mentioned earlier, would allow only the religious to opt out of civil rights laws 
and give them the only exemption in order to discriminate against people that they claim their religion disfavors. Now, Vice President Pence said in his 2000 congressional campaign that he favors conversion therapy. What conversion therapy is, is it is an effort to use religious psychological deprogramming and coerced therapy to try to force gay people to become heterosexual. This is something that could very easily be legally upheld by a reconstituted Supreme Court. Also in December of last year, Trump ordered the Center for Disease Control to stop using seven words, entitlement, diversity, fetus, transgender, vulnerable, evidence-based, and science-based. The head of a very powerful religious right organization, the Family Research Council, Tony Perkins, admitted a few weeks ago that the religious right will not care whatever Trump does because he will give them the nation through the Supreme Court and he is right. President Trump has attempted to remove any and all government efforts to curtail global warming. He has ignored the scientific evidence and believes that this is something which is totally, totally unfounded, even though the science is overwhelmingly true. We are facing a crisis that is more ominous than anything we've ever faced before because of a possible shift on the Supreme Court. Here's what we have to do. If there is a vacancy on the court, even if we fail to stop the nominee, we have to try. In this state, you have to reach the two senators and try to get them to vote against that nominee. All presidential elections need to be a referendum on the Supreme Court. U.S. Senate elections need to be a referendum on the United States Supreme Court. If, in fact, we lose church-state separation, It'll take at least 50 years to get it back, given the composition of the court. We will then have to have our people, meaning non-believers like us, and liberal religionists who favor complete equality for everyone, take over state legislatures. This is a fight that is so grand and so massive. We can't do it just by the standard liberal allies. We need to reach out to people that we otherwise don't have much political common ground with in many areas and work with them on this objective of preserving government neutrality in matters of religion. We're going to have to make coalitions with libertarians who don't want government intruding into the bedrooms. We're going to have to make coalition with economic conservatives who otherwise despise the religious right. Because again, we are one vote away from a religious tyranny. It is now the time well overdue for people, particularly in states like this, to run for local school boards and town councils. It is the time to recruit church-state separationist candidates for the Arizona legislature. Because what the Supreme Court will do will re-empower the states to impose religion any which way they want. And since we will no longer have a Supreme Court that protects us, we will have to have a legislature that will not pass these laws in the first place which means we have to undertake campaigns to put our people in legislative bodies 
in state legislative bodies. Now, when I speak about making these coalitions, and I talk about reaching out to principled conservatives, I want to quote former New York Governor Mario Cuomo, who once said, it is rank hypocrisy for the religious right to preach to us, the American people, uh, about limited government, and then to turn around and to tell us what God to believe in and how to apply the judgment of that God to our bodies and to our bedrooms. This is a struggle where if we lose the Supreme Court, none of us, except for a few exceptions, in this room right now will probably live to see our getting it back. But it is a fight so noble, it is a cause so great, we need to devote ourselves to it, to work for it, even if we don't live to see the results. We cannot forfeit the forever future of America to the religious right. And we must say to the president, we must say, Mr. President, Mr. President, giving the nation over to the religious right will not make America great, whether again or for the first time. It will result in an anti-freedom, anti-science agenda that will repeal the past five to 600 years of the very enlightenment itself. So I know that the news I'm bringing you is not pleasant, but we as free thinkers are realists. So I ask all of you, join the fight and let's hope that whether it's now 50 or 100 years from now, we will forever cement safely and securely in the American fabric of law and politics, the separation of church and state. Thank you. If anybody has questions, please come up uh, to one of the two mics at the ends of the aisles uh, so everybody can hear you. You mentioned legislatures, which I know are very um, important. How about governorships? Is that another really crucial part to look it at? It is, but it's a larger task. Yeah. Uh, once we have a governor, and you raise an important point, that governor appoints the judges of our states. So this means that state constitutions could be relied upon. You're absolutely right, but realistically, we have to start with getting legislators in office. Arizona has simply too many religious right-wingers in both houses. The combination of a religious right Supreme Court and the current composition of this legislature would be horrendous. So that's why I recommend starting in the legislature. Yes, please. I guess I'm <coughs> asking the question why or how can we make a coalition with some of the religious groups? You seem to almost uh, discount that. Um, well, because I'm also with Americans United, I work closely with liberal religionists. You raise an excellent point. There's no reason not to. We reach out to anyone who's willing to preserve the equal rights of everyone. Suppose the unthinkable happens and we do have a court that is conservative on just, for just about every decision. Do we really have to wait 50 years or 30 even? Maybe, to, yes. yes. <sighs> Because he's appointing young justices. Wow. It's unfortunate, but yes. <clears throat> Would you speak to school vouchers? Because it seems to me that's one of the ways they're trying to... Excuse me? School vouchers, which many uh, legislators mm -hmm. are trying to provide to get... We lost that fight in the Supreme Court. We have to keep fighting at the state level. When you have a justice uh, say something like the Bible is more important than the Constitution, 
If you had a Congress that was willing to do it, would that be an impeachable offense? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Would that be an impeachable offense if, if a justice said that the Bible was more important? No, just an opinion. Uh, just an opinion. Ideally, it should be, but it won't be. Anyone else? You want to no, just a little. Okay, I plead ignorant as to exactly how those 13 Russians use uh, social media to influence the election, but I'm wondering if there a way that we can use social media to make an argument to uh, the religious right that seems to be controlling Trump that uh, their ability to practice their religion is best guarded uh, considering how secular Europe is right now, whereas they followed us in uh, disfavoring government-controlled religion. Uh, social media can always be used, but this is coalition building which in today's world means that. It has to be a broad-based coalition that recognizes the equality of everyone before the law. And we work with everyone who would do that. I've always understood that in the past, when appointees were made to the Supreme Court, that they were in for life. And um, while they were on the court, their opinions changed. They continued to grow and evolve. And some of them, in essence, transformed their opinions mm -hmm. about crucial issues. as just a part of the growth process of being on the court. Would you comment on that? Because they were not ideologues, they had room for growth. Today's nominees are ideologues appointed knowing they will not change. <laughs> what? A little stomach soft kilter. If, um, if anybody, if everybody's done with questions, uh, please give Eddie a big thank you.